Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Don Misra is a, uh, a mentor of mine. Uh, she's somebody who uh, I got to know when I was a grad student and, um, and whose work has been seminal in terms of understanding the social determinants of preterm birth and infant mortality. Uh, she has her uh, undergrad and master's from Johns Hopkins, a doctorate uh, from Columbia, has, has uh, served on the faculty of a number of prestigious universities, including uh, Wayne State. She's currently an associate professor, I'm sorry, professor and associate director uh, for research um, at the Department of, of Family Practice uh, and Public Health Services, and, and I cede the podium to her. Thank you very much. So I'm really pleased to see how full the room is. Um, there has been a lot of interest in the conference, which is exactly what we were hoping for. Um, this is a really important issue to all of us, um, and our president has shown great leadership in bringing this up. Um, so Abdul said a little bit about um, what I do and what my interests are, and I am passionate about the research that I do, but I wouldn't be as passionate if it was just, um, if I was a, a chemistry researcher rather than a public health researcher because the things that I study I think do matter and I hope that they will have an impact. And as I'm moving along through my career, I'm seeing more and more that I'm hoping it will take what we know and start to really have an effect. Um, we've done a lot of work in public health in the last couple of decades in better understanding what's going on, but we need to move from that. Um, and so my introduction to, I guess I would say, race and social issues probably came early. Um, I grew up in a working class household actually in Michigan. Um, all of my family is from Detroit but I grew up far, far away in Brighton. Um, but I had that knowledge um, being around uh, the, a uh, father who was a union representative and kind of starting to understand how factors in, in working class families um, were affected by, by, the, by how the world treated them. And when I started college, I um, took a freshman class all about the riots uh, from a sociology professor and started to learn about that history here um, and history in other cities and what led to the riots happening and started learning really that justice and fairness could be really elusive for minorities and for the poor. And that's really something that's had an impact on me throughout my career. Um, in uh, college, I took a class in medical sociology and started learning about infant mortality. And so that was sort of my first introduction to this concept. And, um, and we mentioned it a lot this morning. There's a reason we mentioned it. Um, in the world, infant mortality is seen as a sentinel indicator for how a nation takes care of its population. Um, it obviously affects your life expectancy. If you die in, in uh, the first year of life, you're not going to live. Your life expectancy is very short, and that affects our population. But it also is considered the most vulnerable group in a, in a population, in a community. And if you can't take care of that group, what are you really doing? Um, so it has been a, an area of emphasis for myself, but it's also an area of emphasis throughout public health. So I learned about this as an indicator, and then I went on to um, a degree in maternal and child health and took a lot of courses about maternal and child health, and one of them being about infant mortality. And I have to say, I was shocked when I found out about racial disparities in infant mortality that they were so large. We're talking about two to three-fold differences, so not just a little small percentage increase. But I thought, again, um, as some of the maps that Abdul was showing, well, maybe this is about poverty. You know, I know there's discrimination. I know there's unfair treatment. Maybe it's because this population doesn't have as much access to education, doesn't make as much money. There's, you know, all these explanations. But then I found out we started having some really good research done that showed that women who were college educated, who had a good income, were also, uh, black women were also at much increased risk for infant mortality. And I was very shocked and puzzled. And this began really the area that I'm working in now. I'm trying to understand the reasons for that. And I realized that my focus had been wrong. I was really focused on the individual and on the present. And I think Abdul's shown a lot of slides where you can realize what individuals, um, how when you just focus on the person alone, you miss the story. And do personal actions matter? Well, sure they do. I mean, what we do, do we smoke, we do not smoke? Yes, that has an effect and it matters. But the reasons people take on those personal behaviors and the context in which they live and how the environment supports decisions, um, I think we're starting to understand in public health now that those matter a lot more than just what people choose to do. So we need to change the approach and think about the larger environment that that individual lives in. But I went a little bit beyond that in my work, and I think um, the research on this area is really only just beginning. I don't think it's as far along as the research on neighborhood environment and context, thinking about the life course. Um, so it isn't just where you are now, it's where you've been. And so I started thinking about women who are black women who are college educated, who had a good job. Is that where they always were? 
do they, are they the women who their families grew up poor and then they were able to get to college and achieve this and that's not how they grew up. And so are there lasting effects, intergenerational effects? And what about her own family's life course two generations ago? And what about the course for her population? So when we think about vulnerable populations of minority women and low-income women, where have things been throughout history with that group in terms of their fair treatment? A lot of what Mayor Duggan was talking about, about do we have respect and give the same things to that group and, and think they have the same right to the same environment as other groups? So I actually developed a model for research that um, considered both the issue of the environment and neighborhoods, but also the life course and was explicit about that. And when you look at it in reality, even if you just think about the pregnancy issue, women spend most of their lives not pregnant. So how is it that we think we're going to fix everything with a nice dose of prenatal care for nine months, no matter what, it is, what wonderful things it is we do then? So women come to that time with a whole life of exposures and experiences and health issues. And if we really want to make a difference, we really have to back up into that prior generation. Um, and so my own work has sort of used this model, and I focus primarily on black women, but um, when Abdul actually came to see me some years back, what we were discussing at that time was about Arab American women who were experiencing discrimination and stress from how they were being treated after 9-11. Um, we know that uh, immigrant women and Hispanic women have some of those same experiences, and low-income women can have some of those same stressors. Um, so I started looking at intergenerational work. There was a very large study done in the United States back in, 1950s and 60s actually, in fact, where um, folks followed those women forward into the next generation. And they found out there were critical periods. It did matter. If you were born poor, even though later your socioeconomic status improved quite a, quite a bit, you didn't have the same level of um, good birth outcomes as women who'd always been well off. And that you couldn't catch up from all of it in that, in that one generation, that time period. So that was some of the work we started doing. And then I started thinking about racism. And I, I thought a lot about racism along the context, again, of these women who seem to have kind of um, gotten out of things, you know, achieved their college degree, gotten the jobs. You know, why were they still not doing well? And there was a whole vein of research in um, pregnancy at that time on stress. But it was really being done with my, white middle class women. And they were looking at acute stressors for those women and trying to see why is it that women are at increased risk of these poor birth outcomes. And so these women were, everything else in their life seemed good. They didn't have poor health problems. They didn't have um, any other concerns, but they were still having increased risk. And so some researchers said, oh, well, maybe that's part of the reason for the black-white disparity, and we'll go study um, black women and see if that might be part of the explanation. And they started trying to measure stress in black women. And in fact, they found black women to somehow report lower levels of stress. And this was a little bit puzzling to researchers who generally have been studying uh, minority health. Well, it turned out that the measures they were using were really measures that were appropriate to white middle class populations. They weren't asking about chronic stressors. So yes, these women weren't reporting a lot of acute stressors that today, you know, I got pulled over and got a ticket or um, with the, you know, something didn't go well in my household um, or I had a kid who got sick and I missed a day at work. They were experiencing long-term things like being concerned about evictions be concerned about holding on to their job. And so those long-term chronic stressors were not getting picked up. But what also wasn't getting detected in any of this was the stressor of racism. And so when I first started my work, it was um, considered a little, you know, you could look at segregation and think maybe that mattered. But the idea that you'd be asking people about their experiences of racism um, was, was met with a little bit of skepticism. You know, how am I going to know if there was really racism? Well, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder to some extent. That's what causes the stress. But we persevered, and there were some great researchers out there who had developed measures of this, and we used some of their work, and we invented some things of our own, adapted some of it, and we started looking and started asking. And again, not just about acute racism. So we have some papers showing that micro stressors of things like being followed across the store and reporting experiences of um, being talked down to and being disrespected, yes, those seem to have an impact. And the hypertension researchers were first with some of this work. But the longer term experiences of being black in America and experiencing over your life course um, experiences of racism and those experiences also happening to your friends and family, that had not been as much examined. And we decided we would look at that as well. And so for two of our studies, we actually have found that experiences of racism do have an impact on risk of preterm birth. But it's not simple. So first when we did the studies, we looked at these effects and we didn't see much. And then I started to think about it, um, again, in the issue of context, not so much neighborhood context here, but the context of a woman's life. 
And so we started to think about, well, what kinds of lives do these women have? And we looked at their stress levels, their general stress levels. So we looked at their depressive symptoms. We looked at how they coped with stress. And we started to realize when we looked at all these different effects, there was only one group of women who seemed to be immune from the effect of racism on their birth outcomes. It was women who reported very low stress, no depressive symptoms, were fairly well off in our cohort of black women, and, and had good coping skills. They were okay. But the other groups of women, which were 90% of our sample, when you really looked at them, actually racism was having an impact on their birth outcomes. So we have been continuing to do work on that. We've also done work on neighborhoods. Um, so one of uh, my former fellows is going to talk to you a little bit more about this later today in the context of physical activity. But we asked women not just about where they lived, um, we asked them about their perceptions of where they lived. Um, because we know some of the neighborhood census data may not really capture what your neighborhood is exactly like. And so those measures we published recently, we found that those measures also predicted your birth outcomes, being exposed to neighborhoods that were not as high quality as other neighborhoods. Um, and the neighborhoods we've also started to examine, again, across the life course. Does it matter what your neighborhood used to be like? You know, where did you grow up? Where were you born? Where were you when you were 10 years old? Do we know about those neighborhoods? Do those have an impact? And we have the data for that, and we're starting to look at that. But again, I'm not hopefully looking at that as just a scientific exercise of, of trying to understand it, but trying to think about what we're doing next. So you'll see we have a lot of speakers from Wayne State here this year, and we could have a week-long meeting probably every year with just the work of our Wayne State faculty. Um, we um, have not just health professionals, we have folks from various institutes, um, Merrill Palmer Skillman Institute in Early Childhood, the Law School, the School of Education, the College of Engineering, Social Work. We have arts and music programs that I think also make an impact in terms of studying um, issues of health equity. And we have issues of safety that the university has been a leader in um, improving safety around the campus and in the city. And Wayne State is really committed to achieving health equity um, from the president, who I hope you could see from his remarks, truly understands and gets it, to our faculty, to our students. I encourage you to look at our posters out in the atrium. Some of them are from um, students from all around the region, um, but they include students from our own Masters of Public Health program. We have a new undergraduate public health program, and this is because the students are clamoring for these issues. I spoke last year in an undergraduate group on health equity. They created their own group, and they're starting to do service projects with the community because it matters to them. Um, we have a medical student for, student run free clinic, so they're not just going overseas, they're actually um, doing work in the city. We have a data snapshot um, that's available to you on the desk, and this was done with what we have. Um, and we don't really have a lot of um, data like we would like to have. And so if we want to improve health, we have to get better data on the ground. So that's something that in partnership with um, Dr. El Sayed, we're hoping that we will think about ways to collect the right kinds of data um, for the future. So I am short on time, but I want to encourage you to take a look at our, at our um, summit concept that's in the front of your um, materials for today and look at what our goals are. And you'll notice we really are trying to recognize the impact that structural racism has had and think about what we're going to do in terms of strategies to address these social determinants of health that are upstream but we think matter a lot and that we can do something about. And I'm very encouraged that so much of the community has come for the meeting and I hope we can learn to work together on that.